Okay, hi everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. I have no conflicts. And what I'm going to try to cover in a ridiculous 45 minutes is uh, assessment and management of these four common symptoms. I'm assuming you're getting pain management in other sessions. Um, so constipation, shortness of breath, nausea and vomiting, and anorexia and cachexia. Um, the best way, even though I'm going to subject you to this lecture, the best way to really learn this stuff quickly, efficiently, and actually it's fun, is to go to the Center to Advance Palliative Care website, capc.org, capc.org. Um, because you are Mount Sinai employees, you have free access to CAPSI's online curriculum. You just have to sign in using your School of Medicine email, which our site will recognize and give you membership. And we have about 60 online courses that each are about 20 to 30 minutes long, covering multiple aspects of pain, including the management of pain in people who have opioid use disorder, as well as non-pain symptoms and a number of other topics. So I encourage you to take a look at that. It's probably a better pedagogical method for you to uh, gain this knowledge and skill than the traditional lecture. So um, here's a patient, Mr. B, he's 79. He's here to see you for follow-up of back pain, um, now presenting with diarrhea. His history is positive for metastatic prostate cancer, metastatic to bone, including spine. He was started on long-acting morphine about a week ago and was given a prescription for Colace for prevention of constipation. On his exam, He's slightly distended, um, and on rectal exam, he has a fecal impaction. So what's happening here? Why does he have diarrhea? He has diarrhea because he has a fecal impaction. So what happens when stool kind of hardens and sits like a stone in the rectum is that inflama inflammation develops around that. And that inflammation is basically leads to diarrhea or inflammatory liquid coming out around an impaction. So very important to, in someone presenting with new onset of diarrhea and abdominal symptoms like this, diagnosis one, two, and three is constipation and fecal impaction. Um, and only four, five, and six are less likely things to appear. So what is constipation? The dominant symptoms are abdominal discomfort, straining. It is an unbelievably common problem. 65% of community dwelling adults over 65 have constipation. That means most of your patients have constipation. And particularly when they come into the hospital and their diets change and they're bed bound and their hydration gets messed up and we put them on anticholinergic drugs, it's probably up to near 100% of hospitalized older people. So why should we care? Um, a, it's highly prevalent. B, it makes people feel miserable causes loss of appetite, depression, functional decline. As I said, it can lead to an impaction of stool in the lower bowel, which leads to a functional obstruction. Um, some years ago when I was attending on medicine, a patient died on the medicine service of what turned out to be a stercoral ulceration. That is the impaction lasted for so long and was unrecognized and undiagnosed that the colon actually ulcerated and perforated and the patient died. And looking back, it had been something like 10 days without a bowel movement that was not noticed or addressed. Um, so constipation can be life-threatening when unrecognized and untreated. So how do you assess it? Um, Obviously, you want to look for worrisome signs like bleeding, anemia, weight loss, or a mass. It is really critical to do a rectal exam because you cannot identify an impaction by doing abdominal palpation. You can't even um, identify an impaction with a 
an abdominal film. You can certainly see that someone is full of stool on an abdominal film, but you can't tell whether they're impacted. And knowing that they're impacted is important because the treatment is different if someone is or is not impacted. So what do we do um, when we've identified constipation? So there's behavioral stuff to do, like telling people to try to move their bowels at the same time every day, preferably after breakfast, making use of the famous gastrocolic reflux, reflex that when the abdomen is distended the first meal of the day, there's a reflexive contraction of the rectum. Um, and so when people have lost that pattern, I ask them to uh, use a suppository about 15 minutes after breakfast and go sit on the toilet and try to retrain their bowel to get on a schedule. Fluid, moving around, veggies, fiber, all that stuff is important. But when someone's constipated, they almost always are going to need laxatives. What is the number one reason for an inadequate response to laxatives? Any thoughts? We prescribe stuff that doesn't work. Colase being the number one um, offender. Colase has, there's been now three or four randomized controlled trials of colase and it is no better than placebo. Why this urban myth continues, um, it just, we seem to pass it on generation after generation. It doesn't work, stop prescribing it. So the number one reason for inadequate response is that we doctors don't know what we're doing in managing it. And if we you know, understood what laxatives are and how to use them, we would have more success. So this table um, shows the laxatives that you should use, which are Miralax polyethylene glycol powder which is a tasteless powder that dissolves in water, juice, or coffee, or whatever your patient wants. And it is very inexpensive, and it causes way less cramping and stomach upset than Senna and Bisicodal. So this is usually my first choice. And I start with one scoop a day and eight ounces of fluid, um, go up to two scoops a day. The other osmotic laxatives, lactulose and sorbitol, I don't know if you've ever tasted them, but they are horrible. So you wouldn't give it to your worst enemy and they cost a huge amount of money. There's no reason to prescribe those. Um, stimulant laxatives, which are irritants, they irritate the endolumen of the colon. Um, increase peristalsis through irritation and secretion of water. Lots of cramping associated with them. Some people do well with these and some, very often we need a combination of an osmotic laxative with a stimulant laxative. Don't use stool softeners, no more effective than placebo. Don't use prokinetic agents, a risk of tardive dyskinesia with metoclopramide um, be unbelievably expensive and no more effective than the meds the, on the prior slide. Animas, suppositories, and, dis, and manual disimpaction are really important if somebody is so full of stool that giving laxatives from above is just basically giving laxatives into a bowel obstruction. So what happens if you give laxatives into a bowel obstruction? nausea, vomiting, distension. You have to clear the obstruction before you give laxatives from above. This is why it's so important to diagnose an impaction before you start treatment, which is why a rectal exam is so key. Because if you give laxatives from above, you can actually make matters worse if the patient remains impacted. So first you have to disimpact then you begin laxatives from above. And to disimpact, um, try manual disimpaction, warm tap water enemas, um, bisicodal suppositories, glycerin suppositories, sometimes a combination of all of the above. 
you may have heard of high colonic enemas and thought that that meant that the enema was going high in the colon. It actually means hanging the enema bag at the ceiling and making use of gravity. Uh, use body temperature warm water so you don't put the patient into um, hypothermic shock and never use Fleet's phosphosoda because it, particularly in children, infants, and older adults, the hyperphosphatemia can lead to hypocalcemia and death. So that's constantly ordered, particularly on surgical services. Unsafe should not be used. Only use warm water. And sometimes you have to hang like a two liter bag of warm water at the ceiling and run it in, wait 20 minutes, run it out and keep doing it. And it may have to be done all day long to loosen up a very hardened, basically crystallized mass in the rectum. If that doesn't work, I would call GI because they may need to do something with a scope. Um, in patients who are treated with opioids where severe constipation is nearly universal, after disimpaction and maximal laxative and enema therapy, you can use methyl, methyl naltrexone, sub-Q, or naloxagel, which is oral. It's $55 a dose. It causes very significant abdominal cramping and discomfort. It's quite effective, and it does not pass the blood-brain barrier, so it does not adversely affect the patient's level of analgesia. So it's good to know about it, particularly in intractable opioid-associated constipation. This is just a table with cost comparison. I'll send you this deck so you can look at it yourself, but um, you can see that polyethylene glycol for a month is $18, lactulose is $144, Secretory drugs, $300 a month. Senna, $0.34 cents a month. Um, so remember that even if your patients are insured, lot, many of them are paying large deductibles and co-pays. So the stuff you're prescribing is coming right out of their pocketbook, and you really need to know what these things cost when you're prescribing. So here's what to do. Um, make the diagnosis, history, physical x-ray if necessary. Check to see how many anticholinergic drugs your patient is on and stop as many as you can. Rule out an impaction by a digital rectal exam. If impaction is present, disimpact, enemas, glycerin suppositories until results. Call GI if you don't get results. Adequate hydration, dietary fiber, can start with Senna, two tabs, once or twice a day. If that doesn't work, add polyethylene glycol powder once or twice a day. And then, as I mentioned before, you can try to retrain the bowel to move after breakfast using Dulcolax bisacodyl suppositories after breakfast. And you can use as many as four at once. And what they, as I mentioned, they're an irritant so they stimulate the rectum and the anus to contract. And so if you can combine that with the behavior mod of using the toilet at the same time every day, um, that may help. So that's it on constipation. It deserves its own lecture. Shortness of breath. Um, this is a really important symptom because in patients of mine that have had it, they said they feel like they're drowning. They, it's a terrifying feeling, um, like being held underwater against your will. Um, and it's subjective, just like pain. There's no objective measure of the degree of dyspnea. There's no test you can do that will tell you how dyspneic someone is. There is only the patient's report. So you have to list, ask and listen to what the patient says. The prevalence of dyspnea is unbelievably high, not just in lung and heart disease, where you would expect it, but also in, in dementing illnesses, in end-stage HIV, in patients with ALS, in, and in cancer patients. So this is not in any way unique to the cardiopulmonary system as a, as a cause of distress. Um, and it may be due to the underlying illness, it may be due to profound deconditioning. 
Um, somebody's been in bed or chair all the time, literally sitting up will cause shortness of breath. Treatments may cause dyspnea, hypoxemia, and combinations of all of these. So a diagnosis of dyspnea requires which of the following to be present? Labored respiration, respiratory distress, hypoxia, increased work of breathing, hypercarbia. So the answer is none of the above. It's a subjective symptom. It's what the patient says it is, like pain. So just because someone's not retracting or using accessory muscles or not tachypnic or not panting does not mean they are not dyspneic. So as I said, self-report is the only reliable measure. The management, obviously, we try to re reverse the reversible, um, and there are both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic approaches. Um, and let me just remind you of how terrifying and distressing this symptom is, and how among our many obligations as physicians, the relief of suffering comes at the top of the list. So the gold standard treatment, the most effective, the most well-studied treatment for dyspnea, which cannot be relieved by addressing the underlying illness, such as diuresis for heart failure or bronchodilators for asthma, are opioids. They are unbelievably effective at doses about 10 to 20% of what you would need for pain. So say you might start someone on 10 milligrams of oral morphine for pain, 2.5 milligrams is what you would start them on for dyspnea. Much, much lower doses are effective. So oral or parenteral opioids are the standard initial therapy for dyspnea, not relieved by treatment of underlying conditions. Um, the mechanism of action is really people guessing, but it's thought to be central modulation of the perception of dyspnea because it doesn't change the underlying causes of the dyspnea, but the patient's sense of suffocation gets better. Nebulized opioids have often been promulgated with this th theory that you get lower blood levels of opioids if you nebulize it. Several RCTs show that until you give enough nebulized opioid that you get measurable blood levels, you don't get relief of dyspnea. So there's no advantage to nebulized versus oral or parenteral opioids. So the major barrier to using opioids for dyspnea, particularly when I'm talking to pulmonologists and cardiologists, is their fear of respiratory depression and accelerated death. And that is a huge um, inhibitor to the appropriate treatment of dyspnea. The fear is widespread, but unfounded in several large randomized studies. In fact, people who are suffocating and panicking die more than those who have their dyspnea relieved. Feeling like you're suffocating and panicking is not good for your health or well being. And obviously, whenever opioids or any other medication are used, they have to be used safely and knowledgeably. So proper titration start really low and titrate up very slowly. Um, so again, way less than you would use initially for pain. And these are all of probably not all of, but seven major national American and Canadian organizations that recommend systemic opioids for relief of dyspnea. Um, so it's not just me saying it, um, but you will find real resistance on the part of our colleagues in pulmonary and cardiology, at least I have, uh, to doing this. So be armed with knowledge. There's some evidence of benefit for graded exercise, particularly for people whose dyspnea is due to deconditioning. Handheld fans blowing a breeze across the um, seventh facial nerve, uh, cranial nerve helps. Uh, nutritional support has some benefit. Acupuncture has some benefit. Some people benefit from pulmonary rehab. Um, but as I said, 
if if someone's feeling like they're suffocating, the first thing to do is give them a little bit of opioid and see if see if you can make them feel better. So obviously you're gonna treat underlying causes. You're gonna try to help people with breathing, relaxation and mindfulness techniques, environmental modifications, fans, oxygen, if saturation is below 88% and very underscore very low dose opioids. Now, Mr. B says he is too nauseated to eat. What, given what you know about him, what are the likely possibilities? He's on an opioid, he's constipated. These are the probable reasons for nausea. So particularly among the opioid naive, opioids cause nausea as a side effect in roughly 30% of patients. The important thing for you to know and to tell the patient and the family is that tolerance develops to that side effect in about three days. So I have many patients who say, oh no, I'm allergic to morphine because I threw up. No, they're not allergic to morphine. They have a, they are having a predictable side effect and need to be reassured that it will pass as the body learns to metabolize the drug. Um, and constipation and infection obviously are contributors to nausea, particularly when they lead to a bowel obstruction. So what is nausea and vomiting? Again, nausea is subjective. It's a feeling. We can't measure it with a blood test. Um, it's caused, has multiple causes by irritation of the gastrointestinal lining, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, the inner ear and the cerebral cortex. Vomiting is a neuromuscular reflex mediated by the vomiting center in the central nervous system. Again, general approaches, reverse the reversible. It's really important to reassure, reassure patients. If you have rotated on oncology, it is people get really panicky when they have severe nausea and vomiting. And it's because it just feels like it's overtaking your body. So very important to reassure, to commit that you're gonna get this under control, that it's gonna, it's gonna be controlled and to help people breathe and try to relax improve the environment, good mouth care, hydration, progressive alimentation. But the main thing is to try to learn to choose a drug based on the inferred pathophysiology and neurotransmitters involved in causing the nausea. And very often with severe nausea, combination therapy is required. So, um, these are the various mechanisms of action. Drugs like chemotherapy, toxins, central nervous system disease affect the chemoreceptor trigger zone. And that is mediated by dopamine, serotonin, and neurokinin-1 antagonists. And the neurokinin-1 antagonists are hugely expensive and corticosteroids. If the problem is mediated through the inner ear, the vestibular system, Antihistamines, H1 receptor antagonists, are particularly helpful. If the nausea is mediated through bowel obstruction, um, anticholinergics to reduce peristalsis. Of course, it worsens constipation, but to reduce peristalsis may be helpful. Um, somatostatin analogs may be helpful. Again, they are very, very expensive. And in situations where there are excess GI secretions, again, acetylcholine to reduce peristalsis um, and to dry those secretions and somatostatin analogs. And some of this is um, doctors and scientists trying to put more science on this than actually exists um, because nausea and vomiting is multifactorial and driven often by more than one pathway. Um, but this is at least a way to think about it when you're first starting an anti-nausea regimen. So the dopaminergic antagonists like Haldol and um, Compazine, Reglan, um, affect the chemoreceptor trigger zone are very effective, carry the risk of extrapyramidal disorders. Serotonin antagonists are really commonly used in chemo 
and chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting on Dancitron, Granicitron, um, risk of QTC prolongation, um, affects the chemoreceptor trigger zone, the vagal nerves, and the gut wall. Antihistamines like Benadryl, diphenhydramine, um, hit the H1 receptors in the vomiting center and the vestibular afferents. Um, anticholinergics like glycopyrrolate or scopolamine, again, vestibular apparatus. Th that's what people take if they get uh, seasick or car sick or boat sick, um, various types of anticholinergics. Um, and prokinetics like metoclopramide, um, are sometimes used when patients have diminished peristalsis. Uh, Long term safe treatment, but they are remarkably effective in the short term. And if prognosis is not long, it may be a very reasonable thing to try. Somatostatin analog is octreotide, hugely expensive, reduces secretion of fluids into the gut lumen, sometimes used um, when in bowel obstruction when that occurs. Cannabinoids, good data, not first line. Some patients swear by it. So worth a try, and neurokinin-1 antagonists, aprepotent, fosaprepotent, very, very, very expensive, have to be ordered by an oncologist and approved by a, a pharmacist. They block the activation of substance P from chemotherapy. Okay, so moving on to um, anorexia. A month later, um, Mr. B's daughter calls because her dad's not eating and has lost 10 pounds. She's really worried and wants you to do something about it. So anorexia is a symptom, loss of appetite. Cachexia is the quantitative measure of weight loss. There's two types of cachexia, primary and secondary. Primary cachexia is basically related to inflammation. So you may have had the flu and lost your appetite. That's primary cachexia. That basically the inflammatory process um, says to the body that it can't use nutrition and calories right now. Um, so loss of appetite, loss of weight, loss of strength and energy, very common in cancer, late stage HIV, other serious illnesses, including frailty and stage dementia, Part of why people with end-stage dementia clamp their mouths shut and won't eat is primary cachexia and end-stage organ failure. Secondary cachexia is due to, for example, um, mouth ulcers or depression or um, pain which is distracting or bowel obstruction or anorexia nervosa. Um, that is something, it's not the body refusing the calories, it's something anatomic or behavioral that's rejecting the calories. The treatment, like with everything, is to identify and reverse the reversible. Um, for example, lots of older people living alone don't eat both because they're starting to have trouble planning meals, shopping for food, preparing food, cutting up the food, organizing themselves to have a meal. Um, and you know, the only way to find out about that is to ask. Um, delirium, agitation, restlessness, cognitive impairment. Loneliness is a big cause of cachexia and anorexia. But if it's a patient, for example, with metastatic cancer, who's function is starting to decline, spending more and more time in bed and chair, um, prognosis probably measured in months. Very often it's not the patient who's upset about the anorexia and cachexia, it's the family that's really upset. They think their loved one is starving to death. 
very important to start by asking the patient him or herself if they're bothered by the symptom. Um, because usually when you're not hungry, you don't want to. And the patient is not hungry is because their body can no longer make use of the nutrients and their body is telling them not, not to eat and drink. Um, forcing nutrition on patients like this, either through tube feeding um, or forcing them to eat um, has not been shown to prolong life. That's the most important thing. That's why families do this. They want to prolong life. No data to support that and is associated with all kinds of consequences, not least the ability to enjoy food, that which you can take, the social nature of meals, being with other people, um, and other complications of G-tubes. So only treat if consistent with patient and family goals. So here's another case. This is an 85 year old with COPD and metastatic lung cancer. He's short of breath. He's tachypneic at 30, having difficulty speaking, has coarse breath sounds and crackles. His O2 sat is 92% on two liters. You administer two milligrams of IV morphine. And when you reevaluate him in 20 minutes, how will you know whether the morphine was effective? Is it looking at his O2 sat? his blood gas, measuring his respiratory rate, or asking the patient for the subjective report of relief. It is the latter. The purpose is to relieve the sensation, the subjective sensation of air hunger. Um, we use respiratory rate as a surrogate marker if the patient can't tell us, if they're demented, if they're delirious, if they're too agitated to talk, if they for whatever reason, they can't tell us how they're feeling. Other, and there are times when patients report marked relief of dyspnea, but there's still tachypnea. So tachypnea per se is not a particularly reliable measure of the subjective sensation of suffocating. Here's another um, case, a 70 year old with lung cancer has seven days of constipation. She's been on extended release morphine for about two weeks. She says she's taking a laxative, but it's not working. Which of the following would not be an effective bowel regimen for this patient? Hopefully I've hammered this into you by now. Colace would not be an effective bowel regimen for this patient. Okay. All right, here's a few take home points. Symptoms during serious illness cause human suffering and are treatable, and there is no more profound or foundational obligation of physicians than this is the relief of human suffering. And if you ask patients what their biggest concern is, it's that they will have uncontrolled suffering. And they have very good reason to worry about that because we doctors don't do a good job of assessing and treating suffering. We're much more focused on disease management. So patients need to know that we have their suffering is, what is our concern. And these symptoms are treatable. So management requires assessment, patient and family education and frequent reassessment. Constipation prevention is key. If anyone of you ever prescribe an opioid without prescribing Senna or Miralax at the same time, I will take your license away. You cannot prescribe an opioid without a prescription for a laxative at the same time and tell the family and the patient to take it whether they need it or not. Because it's a life-threatening, totally predictable, totally preventable complication. Nausea and vomiting treatment based on, to the extent that you can link it to a pathophysiology, choose the drug that um, is most closely likely to affect that. Always consider cost. Some of these drugs are just shockingly expensive. Anorexia and cachexia are often not reversible and are signs basically of a systemic inflammatory process and disease progression 
And for dyspnea, self-report is the only reliable measure. If the underlying cause is not reversible, it's not going to respond to Lasix or bronchodilators, the treatment is opioids. So that was, that was a quick race around the track, race for symptoms. Um, any questions or 